I want to talk to you about impedance paper and uh, show you how impedance paper can be helpful in understanding the concepts of impedance as well as frequency response. So let's go over uh, some basic concepts with impedance first and then we'll actually look at an example of uh, using impedance paper uh, as we study a, a network. All right, so the key exponential property that uh, is leveraged <clears throat> in the concept of impedance is the fact that if you have a current I that is of the form E to the ST, where T is a variable of time and S is some constant, then when you take the derivative of that current, you get S times the current back. So it retains the same form, same functional form. We can do the same thing with the voltage, right? If voltage V equal to V naught E to the ST, its derivative is S times the voltage. Now when we consider uh, how this uh, impacts the IV relationship for capacitor, inductor, and resistor, we find that in particular for the capacitor and inductor, uh, this has profound uh, opportunities. So consider the capacitor whose current is C times dVc dt. If we constrain ourselves to a voltage of the form, functional form E to the ST, then when we take the derivative dV dt, we arrive at S times that voltage again. So we get a proportional relationship between the capacitor's voltage and current. That constant of proportionality is S times C, or 1 over S times C, depending on um, which way you're going in that relationship. But it is, it is a constant. Um, this is restricted to functions, voltages, currents of the functional form E to the ST. The same thing is true for the inductor. For the inductor, we have V is equal to L di dt. So when we take the derivative of I, and we can assume that I is constrained to an E to the ST form, we get the current of the inductor back scaled by an amount SL. And so we define the ratio of the voltage to the current, uh, just like we did with Ohm's law, we define that as impedance, but it is restricted for the case where the waveforms are of an exponential e to the st form. So ZR, the impedance of a resistor, uh, doesn't actually change, it's still just R, and it's in ohms. The impedance of an inductor becomes SL, also in ohms, and the impedance of a capacitor is 1 over SC, and that is in ohms as well. So now let's uh, summarize these here. Uh, we have ZR is R, the impedance of the inductor is SL, the impedance of the capacitor is 1 over SC. Sometimes you'll see hear these uh, referred to as complex impedance. Uh, other times we'll just say impedance. But um, there is a distinction, and one of the reasons for the complex uh, impedance uh, label is because we often want to consider the special case where the uh, excitation, the E to the ST signal, is that of a sinusoid. Okay? If you use Euler's formula, uh, you can show that a sinusoid like sine omega t or cosine omega t is made up of two complex con uh, exponentials, an E to the j omega t and an E to the minus j omega t. Those exponential functions still fit the e to the st form, but here we have s is equal to j omega or minus j omega. And in such a case, we refer to this as the AC impedance. It is still the same SL 1 over SC, but it's for the special case where s has been replaced or assigned the value j omega. It's the special case where s is actually imaginary, and it results in um, the impedance of the inductor and the impedance of the capacitor being purely imaginary. Okay? And we note uh, here that the impedance of the inductor is J omega L or J X L, where X L is the reactance of the inductor. X L is equal to omega L. It's a real value. And the impedance, the AC impedance of the capacitor is J times minus 1 over omega C. We get that by multiplying the top and bottom with J. And uh, here we can also express the impedance, the AC impedance of the capacitor as JXC, where XC is the reactance of the capacitor, and it is equal to minus 1 over omega C.
So the reactance of the capacitor is always negative. The reactance of an inductor is always positive. The impedance, the AC impedance of a capacitor is always negative. The AC impedance of an inductor is always positive. And note that if we choose the exact, uh, the appropriate um, omega for a given capacitor and inductor, there will be a value of omega for which the reactance of the capacitor is equal in magnitude and opposite in sign to the reactance of the inductor. And when that happens, that's what we call resonance. That will then be the frequency at which that L and that C together will oscillate. Now let's see how this works out on impedance paper. So let's consider uh, three, value, three component values. Um, note that, um, well let's just start off, we'll have R is equal to 10 ohms. Notice on this impedance paper we have uh, real resistances on the far, on the right side, on the vertical axis, point, uh, or 1 milliohm up to 10 kilo ohms. And um, we have, in addition, two other types of lines. We have positive sloped lines and we have negative sloped lines. Notice that for the positive sloped lines, there are labels associated with those over on the left side, tilting up there, of inductance, 10 microhenry up to 10 henry. And the negatively sloped lines, they're labeled on the right side as capacitances from 100 microfarad at the bottom up to 100 picofarad. Now let's consider the impedance of a resistor of 10 ohms. It's simply going to be a straight line with a slope of zero. It is independent of frequency. The horizontal axis here has been is uh, designated as hertz, but of course that's related to omega. The omega uh, corresponding to any point on this impedance uh, plot would be the hertz frequency times 2 pi. All right. So. Um, Again, the 10 ohm resistor is just a straight line. Let's consider the inductance. A 1 millihenry inductor. We find the, the upward sloping line of 1 millihenry, and that's the one we label. Why does it go up? This goes back to the fact that the reactance of the inductor is, J, is, is omega L, or 2 pi FL. So as frequency increases, the uh, reactance goes up, and therefore, the impedance goes up. And on the other hand, we have that um, excuse me, for a capacitor, we're looking at a capacitor of one nanofarad, 100 nanofarad here, that as the frequency increases, the impedance actually goes down. Now I should note that on the reactance paper, what we are plotting is magnitude impedance. So you're not going to see imaginary or real. We're going to take the magnitude. So what we're really plotting is the, the um, reactance of the inductor and the reactance of the capacitor, XL and XC. So now let's consider uh, what if we took the resistor and the inductor and we combined them in series. Okay, so then we'd have the impedance of the resistance and the impedance of the inductance um, added together, right, because they're in series. Well, that can be done very easily on graph paper, on this reactance paper, by simply considering at every point in frequency which impedance is larger. Whichever one is larger is going to be the one that's going to dominate and is going to control the overall impedance. And so we'd get this uh, overall net impedance that starts out as a straight line um, at low frequencies, and then it would uh, increase um, at a frequency, it looks like it actually would be probably around 1.59 uh, kilohertz, it starts increasing. Now, this may be confusing because you say, well, um, it's not just one impedance or the other, it's the sum of the two. And that's true, except here we're plotting on a logarithmic scale. Notice that for each vertical uh, graduation, we're going up by an order of magnitude. So once we move, um, horizontally to a decade above or below that kind of break frequency there, where we see the slope going from zero to, to positive, then um, the, the, the impedance of the resistor and the impedance of the inductor are so, uh, such, are so different. They're different by greater than an order of magnitude that we can ignore the smaller one. Now where that is not true is right where they intersect.
right? Now we will draw a straight line approximation here, but if we actually consider uh, what the impedance is exactly at that 1.59 kilohertz, what we have is we would have that the resistance has an impedance of 10 ohms and the inductance has an impedance of J 10 ohms. And although I don't have a diagram here, imagine in your mind's eye on the complex plane or the S plane that we have 10 ohms um, on the X axis pointing to the right and we have J 10 ohms pointing vertically on the Y axis and now we're going to consider what is the sum of those two. Well it's a vector sum and the magnitude of that vector is going to be the square root of the sum of the squares where each of those squared terms is going to be the 10 ohms of the resistance and the 10 ohms reactance of the, of the inductor. So the net magnitude impedance of the two in series is simply going to be the square root of 2 times 10 ohms. And that's, that's the impedance exactly at that break frequency where we go from a slope of 0 to plus 1 or to positive. Um, but still, on impedance paper, we still draw it as a straight line, and we note that wherever there's going to be a break where we're changing slope from going, say, horizontal to positive or horizontal to negative, that actually the, the true impedance magnitude at that point is going to be off by an order by a factor of square root of 2. Here, because we're increasing, we're going from a slope of 0 to a positive slope of 1, then the actual impedance is increased by a factor of square root of 2. If we were going to go from a, pos a zero slope to a negative slope because of a capacitor being present rather than an inductor, then we would actually have an impedance at that critical frequency or break frequency that would be square root of 2 smaller than, uh, than what the impedance paper would say. All right, now let's move on to a real example. Uh, oh, wait, let's uh, look one more thing. Let's consider what if we uh, paralleled the resistance and the inductor. Well, now, because in parallel, we're looking at which one has the dominant admittance, right? Which one conducts more. We're actually going to be looking for the smaller of the two impedances, and that's going to dominate or control the net overall impedance. So we end up getting the following line, right? At low frequency now, uh, we get a shorting, if you will, increasingly so as we go to lower frequency thanks to the decreasing uh, reactance of the inductor. But once we go to high enough frequencies it doesn't matter how large the reactance of the inductor is because there's a parallel resistance um, that provides an alternative path for the current and thus we never see an, uh, an impedance that's greater than the 10 ohms of the resistor. Alright now let's go to a, an example. Here's a network that has five elements uh, two inductors, a capacitor, and two resistors, and we're going to excite this one port network with a one amp sinusoidal source. But before we do that, we're simply going to try to uh, plot the overall impedance that the one amp source would see if it looks into this one port network between um, the positive node there and ground. So let's look at one element at a time. So let's consider the L1 we have uh, a positive slope uh, corresponding to 100 microhenry. Let's do the 0.1 ohms. It's a horizontal line, 100 milliohms. L2 is another positive sloped line. Uh, now, when we consider the two together of R1 and L2, because they're in series, we're going to look at whichever one dominates. So we get this light blue line. Let's go on to C1 and to R2. And now we consider these two in, again, in series, which uh, we're going to consider now the combined um, ma uh, maximum, if you will, of impedance between the two. And we get this line. So now we have three elements that are in parallel, L1, R1, L2, and C1, R2. Now when we look at elements in parallel, we're going to look for which impedance is the smallest that's going to dominate. So we can now trace that out. And this is an approximation of the overall net impedance that the current source will see when you look in to that network um, to its right. Now to uh, apply this, let's consider exciting this with several uh, sinusoidal frequencies. Uh, before doing that, okay, I forgot I had this slide. Before doing that, uh, here is a plot actually from SPICE of the actual impedance. Now you see that it's 
it's not nice and straight lines. It's got curves to it because we don't have these abrupt uh, break um, points. But nevertheless, we can still identify different regions in the plot where different elements are dominating. So at low frequency with the rising slope, it's L1 that dominates. When it flattens out, we have R1 now dominating. When it starts rising again, we have L2 because its impedance is actually rising above the 0.1 ohms. After that, further uh, higher frequency, we have the falling impedance of C1 that finally comes down to a magnitude that competes, if you will, with the rising L2 impedance. And so it takes over, providing a, a, a parallel path. Um, so in, impedance goes down, and then ultimately it's going to flatten out due to the 10 milliohm R2. And lastly, we note that there is this um, kind of peaking um, between the positive slope and the negative slope, and this is due to a resonance. I mentioned previously that at a certain frequency, the impedance of the capacitor will be equal to and opposite in sign as the impedance of the uh, inductor, and those will cancel out, leaving just whatever residual resistance there is in the network. If the R1 and R2 were much, much smaller, then you would see a peaking at that uh, point there at the apex of the triangle that would just go farther and farther up. It wouldn't be a nice just constant slope line, a positive one and negative one uh, on the left and right side of that peak. It would actually really like exponentially just shoot up to a very high peak and that's called a, um, you know, that's a resonant point, resonance point. And by getting rid of the lossy elements in that resonant network we can get uh, a much higher uh, resonance uh, amplitude response. This is exactly what happens in a tuning fork, right? It has very low loss. You strike it and then it oscillates at its natural frequency for a good long time because there is very little uh, loss uh, damping elements in it. Okay, now lastly, let's uh, actually apply some sinusoidal signals and consider how um, the system responds. The response here is going to be the voltage across this network, in other words the voltage across the current source. And we're going to start at low frequency, you see the blue triangle that shows us where we are on the magnitude frequency plot. And the red is the current, that's the excitation, and the blue is the response. I'm showing the complete response here, so for the first uh, 25 milliseconds or so half cycle. It's mostly a transient behavior, so you want to ignore that. We're going to focus on the latter part of this uh, transient response. And also note that the blue, which is the voltage, is multiplied, is, is a scaled voltage, and that scaling will change uh, as we go through um, various frequencies. For this plot, I'm multiplying by 100. Okay. Um, Notice that at 20 hertz, which is the frequency of excitation, we're in the region of the impedance plot where it's rising. And so the network is looking largely inductive. If it's inductive, then that means that the voltage must lead the current. You only get current changing through an inductor if you first apply a voltage and then that voltage integrates to produce a current response. And that's precisely what we see here. The blue leads the red current by about 90 degrees. You can check if you want to for the, if the magnitude makes sense, just roughly looking at this, it looks like the magnitude impedance is about 10 milliohms. So when you multiply that by 10, by one amp, you'd get approximately 10 millivolts. Here we've multiplied it by 100, so that puts us at about a one volt um, scale, which, you know, we're, we're a little bit over that, but of course this is a, uh, we can't tell from the magnitude log plot of the impedance. Uh, the precise value of the impedance at 20 hertz. All right, let's move on to um, 800 hertz, and here we're in the flat region where R1 has taken over, and uh, basically R1 is in parallel with L1, and the impedance of L1 now has grown uh, larger, much larger than R1, so we get to see uh, R1, and R1 is providing the primary path for our current. The impedance here is roughly 100 milliohms, um, and so we should see a voltage uh, that is about 0.1, ohm, 0 .1 volts uh, given our 1 amp excitation. That's exactly what we see here. Note that the voltage is scaled by 10, uh, and so that's why it looks like it's at about an amplitude of 1, but it's actually an amplitude of 0.1. The uh, voltage and current are not exactly in phase. That's because if I were to go back to the phase plot here, you notice um, 
that the phase uh, in the flat region here, which is the blue region right here, the phase is not exactly at zero. Okay, We'd have to linger in this flat region longer before the phase would really come back down Okay, it would come back down to zero degrees, and we don't linger long enough because um, L2 comes into play before that happens. Okay, let's head back to um, our uh, time domain plot here. All right, now let's move on uh, to higher frequency. We're at three kilohertz, and now uh, the this region is where the impedance of L2 overtakes the impedance of R1 and so we see a rising impedance and therefore we it's inductive we expect that the voltage uh, that the will be presented to the uh, current source will lead the current and we see that is in fact the case it's leading by roughly 90 not quite 90 degrees but it's leading and it would eventually get to a, a lead of 90 degrees if we let it um, if there wasn't anything more in the network like C1 or R2 now we're approaching the uh, the peak, the resonant peak. I think we actually are right on it at 5 kilohertz. And as I mentioned, when you're at a resonant frequency, the, uh, the impedance of the capacitor and the impedance of the inductor are equal in magnitude and opposite in sign, and so they cancel each other. And so all we're left with is resistance, and resistance doesn't produce any phase shift. And so as confirmed here by the time domain waveforms, we see that the voltage and current are in phase with each other. Um, it also looks like the impedance is right around 1 ohm here. And so um, we see a voltage and a current that are actually truly superimposed. Keep going uh, up in frequency. Now we're on the back side where the impedance is falling due to the capacitance C1. And for a capacitor, the voltage lags the current. And that's because you have to integrate current to get voltage. You have to deposit charge, which comes through time, uh, current and time. Uh, and so we see that the blue voltage actually is lagging the current by about uh, 90 degrees. We now approach or arrive at the flap region where R2 has taken over and we're approaching now an area where the fit current and voltage are in phase. They're not quite there, but if we go up to a last frequency here of 5 megahertz, by this point the phase has returned to zero and we see uh, an exact overlap, uh, zero phase degrees between the voltage and current. And the um, magnitude be difference between voltage and current is a uh, factor of 100 because it's 1 amp times 10 milliohms or 10 millivolts. Okay, I think that uh, concludes this presentation. Hopefully this is helpful in um, both making use of impedance paper and also understanding the concept of impedance uh, and frequency response.